All right, so we're going to be looking at the zeros of polynomial functions. We can look graphically and see where those zeros are happening, where our actual polynomial is crossing the x-axis, but we have to be able to find them algebraically as well. And there is no just general formula for finding roots of polynomials of equations with degree 5 or higher. So we don't have any surefire way to get us there for polynomials of degree 5 or higher. So we have to figure out, first of all, what kind of zeros can we have? Then we'll look at finding them. So our first example, we've got this large polynomial f, and it is power 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So we're higher than degree 5. And what are our options for these zeros? So what are the zeros of this polynomial? Well, from our first product, our first term in the product, we could have negative 3 as our root coming from the first piece. From the second piece, we have a root of 1 half. So those kinds of numbers, we describe them as rationals. So we can have rational roots. But we see we have a lot of different options in there as well. So from the third chunk, our root is negative root 2. From the fourth, our root is positive root 2. So those kinds of numbers are irrational. We couldn't write them as a quotient of integers. So the square root 2 isn't a nice number, basically. All right, and then our last two terms from the product, what are we looking at here? We've got 4 minus 5i for our root, and the last one, 4 plus 5i. And what kinds of numbers are those two? They're complex, and more than that, we have imaginary units. Complex imaginaries. So we can have all of those different types of roots when we are solving for the zeros of a polynomial function. So we have this rational zero theorem, and it gives a list of all of the possible rational zeros, all of the possible ones, and those rational zeros, we usually just call them roots, so you'll hear those terms interchanged of a polynomial function. All right, so that rational zero theorem, what does it give us? So first of all, if we have a polynomial in this form, and it's kind of cryptic with our definition in that box, but what is it saying? All that it's saying is I have a constant on the front and my variable that's involved raised to this power, and this is the highest power that we see is n. All right, so in our last case, if we multiplied it all out, our highest power would be 6. So then our next term is just a constant that's different from the first. That's all that this subscript gives us. And the power on x is 1 less than what we've just seen. So what's happening? It's just in descending order, and the constants are different on the front. So we have a polynomial. It's in that nice form. And it has to have integer coefficients. So these things on the front have to be nice numbers. We have integer coefficients. That's our first blank to fill in. And p over q is a rational zero of f. Okay, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Then p is a factor of the constant term. A naught, so the thing on the end. And q is a factor of the leading coefficient, so the very first thing that we see. Leading coefficient, coefficient on the front, a n. So the highest power term, the number on the front, and then our smallest power term, that constant on the back. We take those two and we look at a ratio of them. So the possible rational zeros, how do we find them? We literally just take the factors from the constant term, from the constant term, all of our different options, and we divide it by the factors from our leading coefficient. 
factors from the leading coefficient. So we have a polynomial in that descending order. Our possible rational zeros are coming from that ratio. We care about the term on the end, the constant, and the thing on the front, and its coefficient. All right, so it seems kind of cryptic. We'll do an example, and it will make sense. So we have this polynomial. Degree 4 is the highest, and it's in that descending order. So we pass that first check. All right, and we care about what? The leading coefficient, the first term, and the last one, the thing on the end. So to find all those possible rational zeros, what do we need? All the factors from the constant term, 4, and all of the factors from the leading coefficient, negative 1. So we just care about the numbers on the front of our leading term and the number on the back. So what are the factors of the constant? So what are my different options? My constant is 4. And what are its different factors? Always plus and minus 1. All right, we can also have 2 from 4 and itself. So 1 and itself are always in that grouping, and then we have to break it down and see, are there other factors that we could split it up into? So what does that mean? I could take negative 2 times negative 2 and get positive 4. We could take positive 2 and positive 2 and get positive 4. We can take positive 4 times positive 1 and get us there. Those are the different factors. So that was just from our constant term. Now let's look for the leading coefficient. Leading coefficient factors. And that one's not as exciting because what is the number on the front of that polynomial? Negative 1. So our only options in that case are positive and negative 1. All right, so how do we build those possible rational zeros? We're looking at the ratio between these. So let's find them. Possible rational zeros. So what's happening? We look at this ratio. Constant terms factors over the leading terms factors. So my constant term, our options were plus and minus 1, plus and minus 2, plus and minus 4, and we're dividing that by plus and minus 1. So when we divide anything by 1, what do we get back out? Just itself. So dividing each of these constants, those factors, by 1 isn't going to change anything. So the options we're getting out are what? Positive and negative 1 still, positive and negative 2, and positive and negative 4 when we look at the division. 1 divided by 1, 1, 2 divided by 1, 2, 4 divided by 1, 4. And they're alternating opposite signs. So in reality, how many possible rational zeros do we have for f of x? I've got 2, 4, 6 of them all together. So these are the possible ones. We had 6 that could be possible just the rational ones that are involved. But actually, how many are there? Actually, there's only two. Only two, and they're at plus and minus two. Actual roots or zeros at plus and minus two. So when we use that theorem, it gives us all of the possible ones, but it doesn't weed out which ones are actually roots and which ones aren't. They just give us all of the options. All right, so let's look at another example, a little bit more interesting, and then we'll talk about actually figuring out where the real rational roots are. Because this theorem just gives us a list of all of the possible ones. So let's take this function f. It's in descending order, which is great. And we want to find all the possible rational zeros. That's the only conversation we're having so far dealing with those nice whole number roots. And we want to find that of this polynomial. So we care about the leading coefficient, and it's a uh, constant on the front, it's 15, and our end value, the end constant, 2. All right, so to find 
the list of all the possible rational zeros, what has to happen. We're looking at a ratio of all the factors of the thing on the end over all the factors of the thing on the front. So from 2, what are my different options for its factors? We've got plus and minus 1 always, and itself plus and minus 2. Not that many options, but that's okay. And then from 15, we have a lot more. What are the different factors of 15? And we'll kind of go in order. 1 is always an option. Is 15 divisible by 2? No. Next one, 3. So we've got positive and negative 3. It's not divisible by 4. It is by 5. And what else do we need? Always 1 and itself. So plus and minus 15 as well. So in this case, we do have a lot more options than our previous example. So let's actually do the division out and look and see how many possible roots we have. So 1 divided by each of these. I'm going to go in that order. Then I'm going to take 2 and divide it by each of these, just to kind of keep it systematic. So plus and minus 1 divided by plus and minus 1. What do we get out? Plus and minus 1. All right, plus and minus 1 divided by plus and minus 3. We've got plus and minus 1 third. That could be one of our roots or two of them. We also have the negative option. Next guy, one-fifth. Positive and negative version. One-fifteenth is also in that list. And those are all the roots just from this first factor of two. We also have this second one as well. So two divided by each of them now. We'll see what we get out. So in addition to these, we've got two, plus or minus two, plus or minus two-thirds. Oh, uh, what's next? Plus or minus two-fifths, and a plus or minus two-fifteenths. So in that case, we have a lot of different options for the roots. And specifically, how many possible ones do we have? Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen, all together. So our possible rational roots, we had sixteen different options, but the actual number only three. And where are they happening at? At negative one, negative one-third, and two-fifths. Okay, so that kind of begs the question, well, how do we figure out where those actual roots are happening? Yeah, I have a lot of options, but that's not going to help me figure out where these are actually occurring. Okay, so we'll take a look at that in a minute. But first, take this polynomial f and figure out all of the possible rational zeros. All right, so the thing on the front, what are we looking at? One, and the thing on the end, six. So we're looking at a ratio between all the factors of the end over all the factors of the front. So what are all of our factors of six? Starting from the beginning, plus and minus one, plus and minus two, plus and minus three, plus and minus 6. All right. Coefficient on the front, the leading term is 1. So we have plus and minus 1. When we do that division each piece, what do we get out? Literally just the list that's up top. So we could have rational roots at positive and negative 1, or they could be at positive and negative 2, 3, or 6. So in reality, how many possible ones do we have? Two, four, six, eight different possible rational roots. So our possible, we've got eight. But let's go ahead and actually figure out how many actual roots do we have to that polynomial? Which ones of those are real and which ones of them are just extra? So how do we determine which of these, if any of them, if any, because we could find all the possible rational roots and all the roots are imaginary. We don't have any of these involved. So that could be a case. We could have absolutely no rational even though we have 16 possible. All right, so how can we determine which, if any, of the possible rational zeros are actually zeros of the function? So to find the first rational zero, we just kind of use a trial and error process 
and we use synthetic division, which we've just learned. Synthetic division. Or other option to get us there is that remainder theorem. Personally, I like the synthetic division because it's faster, but the remainder theorem will do just the same. So if our polynomial is divided by our factor x minus c and the remainder is 0, then that constant c on the end is a 0 of our function. Which makes sense because graphically, if we're looking at it, we have our axes and we're trying to figure out where is the polynomial hitting the x-axis. And at the x-axis, what is our function value there? The output, the height of the function, is 0 because we're staying right on that horizontal axis. So if 0 comes out, then we know that factor um, c is a 0 of that polynomial. Okay, so we can use division to factor the original polynomial, and then we set each factor equal to 0 to find any more. Because again, my function value's output on the x-axis is 0. Okay, our height for the function there is 0. So we're still taking this last example, that function f that we worked on. We had our possible rational zeros, eight different options. But how do we figure out where the actual ones are? So we just pick a root and get started. So we have all those possible. I'm literally just going to start from the beginning with the positives and go in order. That's kind of what I do, but you can start with whichever number you want. So I'm going to take positive 1, and we're going to synthetically divide our polynomial. So my coefficient on the highest power is 1. Next highest is 2. Then we're looking at negative 5 and negative 6. So hopefully remember how to handle these. So what happens? Bringing down the first. Multiplying them together, writing them here. Adding down, we're looking at 3. Multiplying, adding down. Multiplying, and adding down. And the thing on the end, I always circle it so I know that's the remainder and I don't get confused, thinking it's a part of the whole quotient. All right, so what is my remainder in this case? Negative 8 is negative 8, 0? It is not. So that tells me that 1 is not a root. Okay, because I did the synthetic division, I checked that root, and I didn't have a remainder of 0. So that one's out. So what should we try next? I don't know. I'm going to take positive 2 and do the synthetic division and see what remainder we get. So the same story, my root up in the corner that I'm trying is 2, and the coefficients on our terms in our polynomial, we've got 1, 2, negative 5, negative 6. So let's check and see if 2 is a root of that polynomial f that we were looking at. So again, bringing the first one down, multiplying, writing it here, Adding down, we get 4. 2 times 4 will give me 8. 8 minus 5 will give me 3. 2 times 3 will give me positive 6, which gives me a remainder of what? 0. Since we have a remainder of 0 at the end, we know that that c value is a rational 0 of that polynomial. So what does that tell us? What constant were we looking at? positive 2. So we know that 2 is a root or a 0. They're kind of interchangeable. So we found one of them. And we had how many possible? 8 of them. So we found 1. How do we know when to stop? So we know that x minus 2 then is going to be a factor of our polynomial because we always take the constant value and it fits this form. x minus c 
will be a factor of our function. All right, so we know that this is a factor. And we've already broken down our original polynomial into this factor and the polynomial that's left over. We just haven't physically written it out yet. So we know, and our original, this is what we started with, 5x minus 6, it's going to be equal to what? Well, my first factor, x minus 2, since I know that 2 was a root, and what polynomial is left over since we factored that out. So always one power less than what we started with. So we've got x squared. And what's next? 4x and 3. I know my large polynomial factors into this. I know one of the roots is at 2. So how do we go for these other roots? Can we break this one down farther? We can, and all it's going to take is factoring. We could keep trying all the roots with synthetic division, but if I give you 16 possible and there's only two, it's going to take a while uh, to try the synthetic division with all of the options. But in this case, it's already narrowed down for us. I know one of them is at two, and I know two others are going to come out of here. So to find the rest, we just have to factor it. And what do we have to have it set equal to? So to find the rest, We're trying to figure out where our polynomial is touching the x-axis. So when is my function value 0? So we can take it, x minus 2, x squared plus 4x plus 3, and have it set equal to 0. So we're trying to use that principle of zero products. If I take this piece and set it equal to 0, what x value do we get out? 2. We already knew it was a root, so let's find the other ones. We've got a 1 out on the front, so we know it's going to be an x and an x. And 3 is prime, so our only option for those factors are 3 and 1. We need it to multiply to be positive and add to be positive, so both of those will be positive as well. So in this case, what are the different x values that we get out from this polynomial? If the first chunk is set equal to 0, we get 2. And we already knew that was a root from our synthetic division. From our second piece, if that one's set equal to 0, we get out x is negative 3. And then from the last one, if we set that chunk equal to 0, my x value is negative 1. So we found three real roots, even though we had 8 possible. So our solution set, I guess we could say to this, is 2, negative 3, and negative 1. And if you think you've made a mistake with factoring these, how could we check to make sure that these are actually roots of our polynomial? So if it is a root, when I plug it in, what value do we get out? Zero. So I could plug in two into my function, make sure I get zero. Plug in negative three into the function, make sure we get zero. Plug in negative one into the function, make sure we get zero. We could also just graph it and look and see where is it crossing the x-axis at these three points. Okay, so there's one for you to try. Find the, all of the rational zeros of that new f of x. All right, so with that example here, what parts do we care about when we try to find the rational zeros, the possible ones of a function? Thing on the front, coefficient is 1. Thing on the back, coefficient is 20. So we want to look at the ratio between all the factors of the thing on the end, all the factors of the thing on the front. So our different factors of 20, what are my options? Always plus and minus 1. Going up the list, 2, 4, 5. What else is 20 divisible by 10? And always itself. We have those options a lot for that f of x. Okay, and the coefficient on the front? Only options, plus and minus 1. So when we do the division out, we just get this list coming for our possible rational roots. So how many options do we actually have here? We've got 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12 of them. 
I don't want to try all 12 by synthetic division. So hopefully we hit one in the beginning. But let's see. I'm going to start off with positive 1. Go up the list in positives. It's just kind of how my order works. All right, so I'm taking 1. And we're going to synthetically divide our polynomial. So the coefficient on the front, we've got a 1, 8, 11, negative 20. Bring it down the first, multiplying, adding down, multiplying, adding down, multiplying, adding down. So we have a remainder of 0, which tells me what? 1 is a root. So what factor can we take out of our polynomial there? We know it factors into x minus 1, since that was one of our roots. Then the remaining part of the polynomial, what's left? It's ever down here, and again, the power starts one less than wherever we have in the beginning. So we've got x squared and positive 9x plus 20. I already know that 1 is a root. We're setting it equal to 0 and trying to solve for these other two. So how do we factor it? Still have this one tagging along. We've got an x on the front. And we need it to multiply and add to be positive. So we know those signs are present. Combo of factors that multiply to 20 and add to 9. We're looking for 5 and 4. 4 and 5 order doesn't matter. So we know from the first piece, again, that we had a root of 1, just to kind of verify, if I take that piece and set it equal to 0, my x value needs to be 1. From the second chunk, my x value there is negative 5. That's our second rational root. And the last one is at negative 4. So all of our rational roots of this guy, we had 3 out of our possible, I don't even remember how many, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. Only three of them. All right, so it's not so bad when we're dealing with polynomials of smaller degrees. In the last couple cases, we've been dealing with degree three. But usually, if we have a degree four or higher on our equation, it's kind of a pain in the butt to find those roots. So we need to find more than one linear factor by this synthetic division. But instead of trying all of those possible uh, rational roots, we can speed it up a little bit. So one way to speed up the process of finding the first zero is to literally just graph the function. We know what it'll look like if it is a root. What's it doing? Trying to figure out where my function is equal to zero, where we're crossing the x-axis. So any x-intercept that we can see is going to be a root. It's going to be one of those zeros. So if we know that, it's going to save us some time. We already know that whatever is going to be a root, and we can start breaking down the factors. So let's take this example with highest power 4, trying to solve this polynomial equation. So what are our possible rational roots? Constant on the end is 24. Constant on the front is 1. So any of the factors that we get on 24 are going to be our possible roots. So let's actually see. How many do we have? Possible roots, where are they happening at? Things that we can divide 24 by evenly. So always 1, it's even. We can do 2, 3, 4, not 5. We can do 6. I need a second line for my possible roots. We can do 8, 12, and itself, 24. A whole lot. I don't want to do synthetic division on 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16 of them to find the roots, especially if we have multiplicity. I don't want to have to do it double time. So we can graph it and actually see. So graph that equation and see where we have x-intercepts at. Okay, so looking at the picture, where do we have an x-intercept at? Where is it crossing the x-axis? It's touching at 2. So we think we have an x-intercept at 2. 
visually we think so. Okay, and on our graphing system, it's super nice because we can see where the point happens. But on your calculator, if you're tracing along and you come to that value, maybe it might look like 1.999. And if we think it's at 2, how can we test to make sure that that's actually a root and it happens at 2? We can test it with synthetic division. Test with synthetic. And if it is actually a root, if it is verified, our remainder at the end should be what? Zero. So let's see. If we take our polynomial, synthetically divide it by two, what do we get out? So again, my coefficients from the polynomial, we've got one. And I don't have an x cubed term. So what do we need? We need the space. And we could put coefficient zero, make it not exist. So we've got 4, 3 on 2, we have negative 6, negative 8, and 24. So we need that placeholder. It's super important. So let's do that division. Bringing down the first one. Multiplying it out. Adding down. Multiplying again. Adding down. Multiply. Add down. Multiply. And add down. So what do we get in the end? verified my remainder was zero. So for sure, two is a root of this polynomial. So we know it's factored down to what so far? My first factor that I've taken out was x minus two, since I know that two is a root. And what polynomial are we left with? So one power higher than what we started with, we've got x cubed plus two x squared minus 2x minus 12. So we're working towards factoring this thing in total. So we know we can take out that root 2, that first factor. But this is still super gross. Do we know how to, oh I forgot an x on there. Do we know how to break that down? No, unless it's a sum or a difference of cubes. We know how to factor those, but in this case, no. So look back at the graph again, and at 2, what happens? My graph comes down, it touches 2, and is it passing through, or is it turning around? So it touches 2, and it turns around. So we know we have multiplicity there. So what does that mean? So looking at that graph again, going back to the graph, super helpful. We have two multiplicity, or multiplicity at two, because it's touching and turning around. Since it touches and turns around. So I know I have some kind of multiplicity there. So we could try again to see if two is a root of our new polynomial that's created. So can I factor out another factor of x minus two from this piece? We can test. So let's see. We're trying to figure out is two a factor, x minus two, is that a factor of this? So what coefficients do we have on that polynomial? We're dealing with one x cubed, two x squared, negative 2x and positive, just kidding, negative 12 at the end. So we'll do the division here and see if we have a remainder of 0 again. Can I take out another factor of x minus 2? So what happens? Multiply, add down, multiply, add down, multiply, add down. So we have a remainder of 0 at the end. We're verified. So what does that tell me? I've got another factor. So we had our original x minus 2 that we took out by visually looking at our graph, and we verified it with synthetic division. And we saw that it had multiplicity there, since the graph touches and turns around. So it touches twice. And then we take those two factors out, what are we left with? So one power less than what we started with. We've got an x squared plus 4x plus 6. And we're still trying to figure out where is it equal to 0 at. Where is it touching the x-axis? It's touching twice at 2. And what about these two roots? 
can we factor this thing? Can we factor it? I have a 1 out on the front, and I know both signs are going to be positive. So will any combination of 6, or factors of 6, add to 4 when they're both positive? So 1 and 6 isn't going to work. 2 and 3 will get us to 5. We can't factor that thing traditionally. So how else can we go for those roots? Easiest thing to do is plug them into the quadratic equation. So let's do that. Let's try to solve for the other two. X equals negative b plus or minus the square root of what? b squared minus 4 times a, which is 1, times c, which is 6, all over what? 2 times a, which is 1. So we just have to simplify this down. So what are we looking at? Negative 4 plus or minus the square root of what value? So I've got 16 minus 24. So I'm introducing a negative radicand. So what kind of roots are we dealing with here? Imaginary ones. We had two rationals that we figured out from our theorem. But now we have two imaginary ones coming out as well. So let's keep simplifying. 8, we can break it up into a perfect square and something else. Largest perfect square is 4. So we'll also take care of the i. You can kind of do it all in one step. So what's evaluating out of that square root? 2. So I've got negative 4 plus or minus 2i root 2 all over 2. So we could look individually at the division. Negative 4 divided by 2 is negative 2. And 2i divided by 2 is just i left over and root 2 hang on. So we've got two imaginary roots, positive and negative there, and two roots, two roots at 2. It's just one number, but it's touching twice. So what are our different uh, solutions to this equation? With our set notation, we never write repeats. So even though it's touching twice at 2, we only write it once. And then our other roots. One is at negative 2 plus i root 2. Other one, negative 2 minus i root 2. So we had a whole bunch of possible rational ones. The only one that actually worked was 2, and it was touching twice. And we had two imaginaries as well. So if we're graphing this and looking at it, can we see those imaginary roots? No, because it doesn't have a practical application like the rational ones do to see where it's touching the x-axis. So those guys are kind of tricky. We have to really rely on the process, working through the synthetic division and finding the rational roots and making that last factoring easier. So in that last example, 2 is a repeated root of that equation. And it showed up how many times? It had multiplicity 2. So if we count that multiple root separately, that fourth degree equation, since we had the highest power 4 that was visible, had how many roots? Four of them. If we count the multiplicity individually, we had two real rational ones and then two imaginary roots. So there is something to that. So the properties of polynomial equations. If a polynomial equation of degree n, that's the highest power that we see, then counting multiple roots separately, the equation has how many roots? Before we had fourth degree and we had four roots. If we have third degree, we had how many? Three roots. So if I have an n degree polynomial, we have n roots. And if we have an imaginary, what happens? If a plus bi is a root, if we have an imaginary and the middle is positive, then what happens? There's also another root, and it happens at the opposite. a minus bi is also a root. So whenever we solve for those imaginary roots, if they exist, they occur in those conjugate pairs. Conjugate pairs. So underline that part. They always come like that. If I've got a plus bi, 
then my other root is going to have to be at a minus bi. Even if it's not specified, they always come in pairs. All right, so the fact that a polynomial equation of degree n has n roots is a consequence of a theorem proved in 1799 by a 22-year-old. He was 22, Carl Goss, in his doctoral dissertation. So 22 years old, he was working on his doctorate and figured all this out. My mind was blown. I was not doing that at 22, but hey, to each their own. So we have this result, the fundamental theorem of algebra. So if f of x is a polynomial of degree n, where n is bigger than 1 or equal to 1, because that would be boring if it was a constant, then the equation, if we set it equal to 0, has at least one complex root. Okay. So we talked about all the possible rational roots, but if I have a polynomial higher power than 1 or equal to 1, when we set it equal to 0, it has at least one complex root. So again, looking at this example that we just worked through, where were those four roots? We had one at 2, another one at 2, we had one at negative 2 plus i root 2 and negative 2 minus i root 2. So they did really show up in those conjugate pairs. I've got a negative option and a positive option. So how could we factor that polynomial down? We took out these two roots and had a nice uh, factor, but how do we write it with these imaginary roots as a factor? So again, how do we write our roots out? If it is irrational, then what is the factor? x minus that thing. Next root, as a factor, x minus that value. So when we set it equal to 0, what do we get out? 2 and 2. Same story if they're imaginary. x minus that root. And then the last factor, again, x minus that root. So it's kind of ugly form to write our imaginaries in that way, but we can write it like that. Doesn't matter what kind of root we're dealing with, in order to factor our polynomial, how do we write it? x minus whatever thing we're looking at, whatever zero we have. x minus our zero, x minus our zero, x minus the zero, even if they are imaginary. So these are all of our linear factors. Individually, we can look at these, and the highest power on x individually is 1. So I've got x to the first, x to the first, x to the first, x to the first. These are all of the linear factors. All right, so that fourth degree equation, highest power that we saw was 4, has four linear factors and four roots. Just as the nth degree polynomial has how many? n roots, n linear factors. Okay, so we're going to use that to be able to create some polynomials that fit certain constructs. So on the next page, we have that linear factorization theorem. If our polynomial is in descending order, that's what that first line tells us, and the power is higher than 1, then we can factor it, just like we've been doing. x minus the root, x minus the root, x minus the root. Doesn't matter the form of uh, the constant on the end. Could be a complex number, could be a rational one. Doesn't matter. So we're going to use that to find a fourth degree polynomial equation, polynomial function. We're going to call it f of x with real coefficients that has negative 2, positive 2, and i as the zeros, and it's going through the point 3, negative 150. So if I evaluate my function at 3, I get out negative 150. So just using that theorem, I want a polynomial of degree 4. So how many roots am I going to have? 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay, so the same story, it's going to fit that form. And in this last case, we didn't have a constant down on the front. B 
because x to the fourth only had a one. There wasn't anything common that we could take out of all of them. But sometimes that happens. So we want to take that into account as well. So what is this form going to look like? f of x, it has to have four different roots, and we could have factored out a constant on the front. So I'm going to call the constant on the front an, because if there is one, it's going to sit on the highest power term. And then what? I've got four different roots. So I've got x minus some constant. I'm going to call it c1. I've got another root. I've got another one. And I've got four all together. And it's not guaranteed that they're the same, so we call them different until we find out, actually, what they are. And in this case, what are the roots that were given? Negative 2, 2, and i. They only gave us three, but it's a fourth degree equation, so we have four roots. So where is our fourth root coming from? Looking at our imaginary unit, they always come as what? conjugate pairs. So I have the positive version. My other root is going to happen where? At negative i. If it's not explicitly told to us, we have to think about it. They gave me three and I have a fourth degree, so I'm missing one. So the fourth zero or the fourth root is happening at negative i. So we have those constants to plug in. One of them is happening at negative two. One of them is happening at positive 2. One of them is happening at positive i. And one of them is happening at negative i. Plugging in the constants that are roots. x minus our root. x minus the root. x minus the root. x minus the root. Well, that's kind of ugly form. So let's make that look a little bit nicer. We still don't know if we have a coefficient out on the front. We'll deal with it later. And x minus a negative 2, we get a positive, x minus 2, x minus i, and x plus i. And if you think you've plugged these in wrong, set it equal to 0, what roots come out? Negative 2, positive 2, i, negative i. We have all of them. Okay. Can we make that look any nicer? We could still multiply them together. And kind of naturally, instead of going left to right, how should we combine these? We've got a difference of squares here and a difference of squares there. So those will turn out nice if we multiply them together. So let's do that. I still don't know what the constant out on the front is, but what's going to be evaluating out of this product? x squared minus 4. That's a little bit nicer on the eyes. And out of this piece, x squared minus i squared, and i squared is negative 1, so minus negative 1 will give us plus. And you can always foil it out on the side if we can't work uh, that quickly. So we almost have the function definition. We've got the roots taken care of. The other piece that they gave us is the point that it's going through. So when I plug 3 into my function, I need to get out negative 150. And that will help us determine where that coefficient on the front actually is. So we know f of 3 has to be equal to negative 150. So when we plug in 3 into our function, we have to figure out what we get out. It has to equal negative 150. So we have one unknown there, and we filled in all the other blanks. So simplifying down, what are we looking at? a n, this value, 9 minus 4 will give me 5 times what? 9 plus 1 will give me 10 is negative 150. So we've got 50 a n is equal to negative 150. So what does that mean for our constant out on the front? a n is going to be what? Negative 150 divided by 50, which is negative 3. So we know the constant out on the front has to be negative 3. So our fourth degree polynomial with these coefficients going through that point, what is its definition? In the end, f of x is equal to what? Constant out on the front, negative 3. And the other pieces in their nice form where the roots are happening, x squared minus 4 and x squared plus 1. 
and if you think you've done it incorrectly, factor it back out. Get us here and set it equal to zero. See if those roots actually occur at negative 2, positive 2, i, negative i. We could also graph it and look there as well. All right, so the last one for you. Find a third degree polynomial with real coefficients that has negative 3 and i as zeros, and it goes through the point 1, 8. All right, so how do we start that one? We're dealing with a third degree polynomial. So how many roots are we going to have? three in total. So we know f of x is going to fit the form. I could have a constant on the front, and I've got x minus one root, x minus another root, x minus a third root. We don't know if they'll all be the same, but we do have two of the roots given. And where is that third root sitting at? Conjugate pairs always come together, so our third root, third root is at negative i. So we can plug in those pieces of information that we have. I still don't know where the constant on the front is, if we have one. Or it could just be a one, we always have one. And where are my roots happening? X minus negative three, plugging in that first constant. Next constant happens at i. And the last one, minus a negative. So simplifying it down, we still don't know where the coefficient on the front sits but I've got x plus 3, x minus i, and x plus i. Multiplying them together to make them look nicer, we don't have any pair with x plus 3, but we can multiply these two together. We got a difference of squares. So what do we get out? We got a n, x plus 3, and we get x squared plus 1. Same story. So we're almost there. We have where the roots are happening and it's still degree 3, but we have to figure out if there is a constant on the front. What is the constant on the front? So when I plug in 1 into my function, what are we supposed to get out? 8. So I still don't know what the coefficient is, but I know when I plug in 1 for x, 1 for x, we get out 8 for y. So we can solve a n times 4 times 2 is equal to 8. So I've got 8 of them times my constant is equal to 8. So what does that mean for the coefficient out on the front? It's a boring case. It's just 1. So what is our function? Degree 3 going through those three roots and that point. What's it looking like? 1 out on the front, so we won't write it. And we've got x plus 3, that factor, and x squared plus 1. Okay, how can we check to make sure that this is actually degree 3? Because right now I've got degree 2 and degree 1 that's involved. We can FOIL it though and make sure that the highest power coming out is degree 3. So we can just check real quick. Another form of that equation, another way to report it. Let's do it. We've got x cubed and outer positive x, inner plus 3x squared, and last plus 3. So we write it in descending order. We've got x cubed plus 3x squared plus x plus 3. So is our function of degree 3? Highest power that we see is there. All right. So go ahead and be working on that homework. If you have any questions, shoot me an email. I'd be happy to help. I'll see you on Tuesday.